Good morning. Today is Sunday the 15th, and we're going to start with a daily reflection on the New Testament. After three days they found him in the temple, and all who heard him were astonished at his understanding. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt why hast thou thus dealt with us? And he said unto them, Knew ye not that I must be about my father's business? Joseph Smith translation, Luke chapter 2, verses 46 through 49. Under Jewish law, at age 12, Jesus became a son of the law and subject to its obligations. Participate in the annual Passover celebration, enter the temple courts, ask and answer questions, and listen to the learned rabbis. That he was in the temple at age 12 is not unusual, but the knowledge and understanding he demonstrated there were astonishing. Jesus knew that he was the Son of God. In response to his mother's inquiry, he offered his first recorded testimony that God was his Father. Neither a criticism nor a reproof, the Son of God simply clarified that he knew that both Mary and Joseph, what both Mary and Joseph knew. He who was perfect, even at age 12, offered no disregard for loving earthly parents who had taught and nurtured him for his first 12 years. His gentle word was in, no, was in fact not just a statement about who he was, but also a sobering reminder about the road ahead. Okay, so today is... Learn of me, chapter 8, the atonement through Jesus Christ. And it's a long one, clearly, because it is just, you know, the pinnacle or whatever. I don't know what that haze is. I don't know if it's my light or my camera. I think it's my camera. All right. So, um, at the beginning, it gives you some definitions. What the atonement is, transgression, justification, grace, propitiation, first fruits, remission, reconciliation, and atone. Uh, just giving you some context as to uh, what words are going to be used in the scriptures that follow. And there's quite a bit. So, atonement, satisfaction or reparation for a wrong or injury. Amends, the doctrine concerning the reconciliation of God and humankind, especially as accomplished through the life, suffering, and death of Christ. Experience of humankind's unity with God, exemplified by Jesus Christ, reconciliation agreement. And then one I also want to do is grace from the Bible dictionary. Divine means of help or strength given through the bounteous mercy and love of Jesus Christ an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold on eternal life and exaltation after they have expended their own best efforts. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pages. So we're not going to go over everything, um, but we are, I'm going to, read some quotes, ask some questions, and see how that goes, because we're not going to get through 10 pages unless you want it to be 45 minutes long. But here's a question from Russell M. Nelson, um, drawing the power of Jesus Christ into our lives, April 2017. Under the Father's great eternal plan, it is the Savior who suffered. It is the Savior who broke the bands of death. It is the Savior who paid the price of our sins and transgressions and blotted them out on condition of our repentance. It is the Savior who delivers us from physical and spiritual death. There is no amorphous entity called the Atonement upon which we may call for succor, healing, forgiveness, or power. Jesus Christ is the source. Sacred terms such as Atonement and Resurrection describe what the Savior did according to the Father's plan, so that we may live with hope in this life and gain eternal life in the world to come. The Savior's atoning sacrifice, the central act of all human history, 
is best understood and appreciated when we expressly and clearly connect him to it. This, I feel, is what he's trying to say is you can speak of the atonement in a broad sense of the word and um, and kind of take it as a what is it as um like a fact of life it's just a fact of life the atonement happened um but when you connect christ to it what it actually was you know the atonement isn't isn't a golden calf that you worship it is an act that christ did it is not the act that's going to save you it is christ that is going to save you um a question here that they have is how can i focus more on ministering to others needs and follow the savior's example of sacrifice um here's a quote from neil a maxwell hope through the atonement of jesus christ october 1998 life's disappointments often represent the debris of our failed proximate hopes instead however Sorry, the light's spazzing out. Instead, however, I speak of the crucial need for ultimate hope. Ultimate hope is a different matter. It is tied to Jesus and the blessings of the Great Atonement, blessings resulting in the universal resurrection and the precious opportunity provided thereby for us to practice emancipating repentance, making possible what the scriptures call a perfect brightness of hope. Can you guys see that on camera? I feel like I'm gonna have a stroke or something okay um and then I have underlined here one of the scriptures listed Romans chapter 5 verses 8 through 12 and 18 through 21 but the part that I have underlined here is moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So even though sin and offense abound and sometimes you feel overwhelmed by it, like there's no hope, grace abounds much more. That There's more grace than there is sin. And though we don't want to sin more than we take upon us, the enabling power of repentance it's nice to know that it's there um, another question what can I learn about my Heavenly Father from the sacrifice of his son what did Christ do to show me what humility and obedience look like how can I exercise these attributes more fully how can I help those around me turn to Jesus Christ and access his atonement through the atonement and those singular events surrounding it, all of the terrible individual and collective sins of all mankind were taken upon the Lord's shoulders. The marvelous result of this great suffering was that he was able to redeem from physical death the believers and the obedient, as well as the unbelieving and disobedient. Every person ever born or yet to be born is the beneficiary of both, of both the med mediation and the atonement of the savior the act of the atonement is in its simplest terms a reconciliation of man with his god the word atonement means to be at one it is literally at one meant james e faust the supernal gift of the atonement october 1988 in addition to forgiveness from sin what infirmities or sufferings can jesus christ suffer for me this question I is helpful in these days um, with Brent's father passing away yesterday and with grandma's diagnosis of you know liver cancer we went and saw her yesterday and 
they said four months. I don't think she has four months. Um, the, the suffering that he can help with is, is this comfort of the plan of salvation. You know, just give us, give us a testimony of the plan of salvation. Give those who are suffering a plan, a testimony of the plan of salvation. Give them a true knowledge of it so that the loss of Brent's dad and the loss of grandma won't be heartbreaking, heart rending, unbearable. Losing dad was hard. It was really hard, but thankfully, you know, you have a testimony, you can, you can, you can get over it and, and you can move on and you can, you can grow. You know that he's, he's there on the other side doing his work and he's happy and he's free from pain. And, and that's the consolation that you take from it, that one day you'll be with them again, that you'll see them. There will be a glorious reunion unlike any other. And that's, that's the consolation you take. Um, see Scott grow the miracle of the atonement, April, 2011. We access the atonement through repentance. When we repent, the Lord allows us to put the mistakes of the past behind us. Jesus Christ is the great healer of our souls. With the exception of sins of perdition, there is no sin or transgression, pain or sorrow, which is outside of the healing power of his atonement. That is also a, a, um, a comforting thought. I'm never outside the reach of him unless I deny the Holy Ghost. I'm always within the bounds of forgiveness. All right. Lynn G. Robbins, The Righteous Judge, October 2016. An unwillingness to sacrifice as part of our penitence mocks or belittles Christ's greater sacrifice for the same sin and trivializes his suffering, a callous sign of ingratitude. On the other hand, through the sweet irony of sacrifice, we actually gain something of eternal worth, his mercy and forgiveness, and eventually all that the Father hath as part of the repentance process sacrifice also acts as a healing balm to help replace remorse of consciousness with peace of conscience without sacrifice a person may find it hard to forgive himself or herself because of a lingering consciousness of something withheld this one is underlined in my book and sometimes double underlined um the part where it says that an unwillingness to sacrifice belittles Christ sacrifice for the same sin. He's, he's already suffered for the sin. And if I'm not willing to do what he has done for my sin, that same exact sin, then I'm mocking what he's done for me. It, like when you look at it that way, that just hit, hits home and just kind of pierces your heart and makes you want to go, you know, am I willing to sacrifice just as much as he did for what I did? Um, last one. When we feel troubled, unsure, afraid, or discouraged, doing the following can help us access the power of, of grace and the atonement. Believe in the Father and in the Son and all they promise to do for us. Obey God's commandments and partake of the sacrament regu regularly to build spiritual strength. Pray, fast, study the scriptures, and worship in the temple to feel God's love and know of his promises. Carolyn J. Rasmus, The Enabling Power of the Atonement, Enzyme, March 2013. Last question here. Based on these scriptures, list the many things that Jesus Christ atoned for. Uh, how can I gain greater access to this enormous gift? And that's just something to think about. All this, all these questions here, these are personal pondering questions. We don't need to answer them out loud. Then some additional study uh, references, Russell M. Nelson, The Atonement, October, 1996. Bruce R. McConkie, The Purifying Power of Gethsemane, April, 1985. 
uh, Brad Wilcox, The Continuous Atonement, Deseret Book, 20, uh, 2009. Floyd K. Packer, The Reason for Our Hope, October 2014. And it goes on and on. But that's what I got. That's what I got for today. I will now leave you with a prayer from a diary of prayer. It is the 15th, and this one comes from a a Abby Paul, Courtier, and Pierre Michelon. O Lord Jesus Christ, who on the eve of thy passion didst pray that all thy disciples might be one, as thou art in the Father, and the Father in thee, Grant that we may suffer keenly on account of the infidelity of our disunion. Grant us the loyalty to recognize and the courage to reject all our hidden indifferences and mistrust and our mutual hostility. Grant that we may find each other in thee so that from our hearts and from our lips may ceaseless, ceaselessly arise thy prayer for the unity of Christians such as thou willest, and by the means that thou willest. Grant that in thee, who art perfect charity, we may find the way that leads to unity, in obedience to thy love and to thy truth. That's a good one. Unity, despite our differences, put away our hostility. Be kind and welcoming. Unity, because there's so much disunity in the world today. All right. I love you all. That was Learn of Me, Chapter 8. We do Chapter 9 tomorrow, which is Authority of Jesus Christ. And uh, we will see you then. Bye.